Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your patience and thank you for your patience for folks that are joining us on the online, it's taking us a few minutes to get folks gathered here today on this Friday afternoon. My name is Cara Carter. For those of you I don't know, I am the Senior Vice President for Strategy and Programs at the California Healthcare Foundation, and I am thrilled to welcome you all this afternoon. This is actually only our second in-person briefing since COVID-19 restrictions began. Um, I'm so grateful that we're able to have the opportunity to gather like this, and I'm grateful for you all for coming in on what is, in fact, an absolutely gorgeous Friday afternoon in Sacramento. The California Healthcare Foundation is an independent nonprofit philanthropy, and we work to improve the healthcare system to make sure that all Californians have the care that they need. We focus particularly on making sure the system works for Californians with low incomes and for communities who have been historically to face the biggest barriers to care. Our headquarters are in Oakland. We have an office here in Sacramento, and we have a number of colleagues that work in the, in the southern part of the state. Today's convening is one of a regular series of briefings that are in person and they're virtual that we sponsor here in Sacramento for Sacramento policy staff and other folks that are interested. These briefings have two purposes. So they're designed, first off, to bring you the information that is relevant to healthcare issues and trends, and secondly, to promote dialogue on potential solutions to the challenges the state faces. In addition to the folks in the room, there are over 450 people on our Zoom today. Um, we're excited to welcome both our in-person colleagues and our, and our remote colleagues. And for folks who are curious, we will make a video of today's briefing available so people who aren't available today were able to watch it later. Our briefing today is about a key part of the health workforce in California, our community health workers and promotores and community health representatives. My colleague Carlina Hansen will take the stage in a few minutes and she'll talk more about that. But these workers have a long and incredibly critical history in supporting our communities. They often serve as a critical bridge, connecting people who are not well served by traditional healthcare system to the services that they need. During the COVID-19 pandemic, they were heroes on the front lines. They combated misinformation. They connected people to the supports they needed to survive. They promoted vaccinations and they helped save lives. The pandemic's disproportionate effects on people of color, particularly Latino and Black Californians, laid bare the structural racism that has long existed and permeated our healthcare system. It is our collective responsibility to now uproot and eliminate that racism. Part of this work is ensuring that we're building a health workforce that reflects the rich diversity of the California population and is deeply connected to the communities we all live in. Community health workers and promotores and community health representatives have a vital role to play in creating a modern healthcare workforce. We were very encouraged by the commitment to expanding and supporting this workforce in last year's state budget. While California's financial situation has changed, the need for community health workers, promotores, and community health representatives is greater than it has ever been. They've been serving California communities for decades, and now it's time for us to serve them better. How do we ensure that this, is, that this is a workforce that is well compensated, fully respected, and given the opportunities to advance in their careers? How do we rapidly expand this workforce without over-medicalizing it or diluting their connection to community? How can we help new partners like Medi-Cal managed care plans engage with community health workers and promotores in a way that is mutually beneficial and respectful? How do we ensure that all of this work is ultimately impactful for Medi-Cal members who we put at the center of everything that we do? And what is the role and the responsibility the state has in growing and supporting this workforce through this time of transition and growth? I couldn't be more thrilled to bring together today a series of uh, distinguished researchers and speakers to have this conversation on our panel, and I hope that you will all enjoy it as much as I know I will. Carlina Hansen, a senior program officer at CHCF, leads the foundation's work around the community-connected workforce. She's going to kick us off in a few minutes with a short overview and introductions, and then she'll serve as a moderator of the panel discussion. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A following the panel. Before I hand to Carlina, I have a few housekeeping items that I've been asked to kind of convey. The first is around uh, questions. If you have a question, and we very much hope you have many questions, and you're sitting here in the room with us, please save those questions to ask during Q&A. We'll have mics circulating for them at the time. 
If you're joining us on Zoom, please submit a question at any time by clicking on the Q&A icon. Use the chat function for technical issues only. This session is being recorded, so the recording will be available on the CHCF website early next week. You'll receive an email with a link once it is available. And finally, for those of you on Zoom, we have both captioning in English and in Spanish, as well as translation to Spanish. Please check the Zoom chat for instructions on how to access those options. Now, please join me in welcoming Carlina to the platform. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I want to uh, just thank Cara for the introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here with you in person. I have to say a teeny bit anxious to be away from the safety of my own living room. Um, but I am uh, definitely sure that my dog will not bark when the doorbell rings. So that gives me a little bit of confidence. Um, so I am thrilled to be able to talk to you today about the community health worker workforce. Um, Cara has gone over the housekeeping items. So um, just who are community health workers, promotoras, and representatives? As Cara said, they are community members who offer a wide array of health and public health services and have been do doing so since the 1970s, and some would say long before that. Those services can include providing culturally competent health services, health promotion and education, assistance in accessing medical and social services, care coordination, patient advocacy, and much, much more. You may also be wondering why the long acronym, um, CHWPRs. It is because there are critical members of this workforce who have a unique identities and a long history of serving California's diverse communities. Um, P stands for promotores, who largely work in Latino, Latinx, and Spanish-speaking communities. And the R stands for community health representatives who have long worked in American Indian and Alaska Native communities. So I want to start by grounding us and sort of emphasizing some of the points that Cara made um, about why this workforce is important and what exactly is driving the increased attention by healthcare systems and policymakers in California. First and foremost, as we know, there are far too many people in California who have been impacted by racism, xenophobia, discrimination, and trauma, all of which, of course, can have a negative impact on their health. The systems that are designed to support Californians have work to do to dismantle systemic racism. CHWPRs are part of the solution. It is, however, important to be clear when we talk about the workforce that, that they are not responsible for solving the woes of systemic racism in the healthcare systems. They are part of a solution, a solution that all of us need to be playing a part in. So evidence also tells us that shared identity can shape people's health experience and outcomes. We also know that shared language is important all the more so because so many Californians choose to receive access to healthcare in languages other than English. Yet the demographics of California's health workforce does not match the population of the state, let alone the population of Medi-Cal. The CHWPR workforce is racially, ethnically, and linguistically diverse, and they often share other intersecting identities with those they serve an experience of homelessness uh, or incarceration or a shared identity around gender expression or socioeconomic status. These kinds of shared experiences build trust, which Cara talked about. CHWPRs are bridge builders who support people's health and well-being. Additionally, as I think many of you know, the Department of Healthcare Services is encouraging health systems and Medi-Cal managed care plans to be more community connected, to reach out into the community, to meet people where they are, as opposed to waiting for, us, for them to come to us. CHWPRs are an important part of this effort. Their work often happens in the community, um, at health fairs, churches, homeless encampments, or community centers. 
This kind of outreach is important because it meets people on their own terms. Finally, CHWPR interventions work to help people controlling their diabetes or addressing chronic health conditions. Um, so with that, I want to um, introduce our wonderful Jackie, who is going to be presenting some of the research that CHCF has funded to reinforce some of the evidence that we know about uh, CHWPRs in the state of California, um, both from their perspective and the perspective of employers. Um, Jackie, who is with the UCS, uh, UCSF Health Force Center, um, has been a critical partner of ours in learning more. And um, I invite you to the stage. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Carlina, for the introduction, and thank you everyone so much for being here today. As Carlina has mentioned, I am here to um, discuss the recent research that we at UCSF have done about community health workers and promotorists. So I will start by providing some general notes about, about our research study as a whole. Um, first, the research focused on California only. Um, second, um, the research was informed by an advisory group, um, which, rep seven, which represented seven different organizations. Um, and these advisors really aided with survey development and interview guide development. Third is that the study population cap captured information about CHWPs who are both volunteering um, and in paid positions. So the initial goal of our project was to measure supply and demand of CHWPs um, but we experienced barriers to assessing supply, which I will discuss in a little bit more detail soon. The project comprised of four main components, which resulted in four main reports. First, we surveyed and interviewed CHWP training and education programs across the state. Second, we surveyed CHWPs themselves. Third, we surveyed CHWP employers and healthcare settings. And fourth, we interviewed CHWP employers in a variety of settings. So today I'll be presenting highlights from all four reports, but the full reports can also be found on CHDF's website, with the exception of the employer interview report, which will be finished soon. So first I'd like to talk a little bit about CHWP supply and why it is so difficult to measure. One of the reasons that we set out to measure supply is, be is because we know that the national and state sources that count the workforce, like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, vastly undercount the number of CHWPs. Although there is an SOC code for the community health worker profession, the code does not capture all workers who perform the many different roles that CHWPs can have. Additionally, there are separate codes for different roles that can overlap with CHWP work such as health education special specialists and mental health counselors. The workforce also lacks a licensing or certification body to track the workforce, which, which many other professions use to aid in measuring supply. Lastly, as many of you know, there are different job titles used to capture CHWP work. Part of the reasons why there are many different job titles be is because there are so many different roles that CHWs can have. Oftentimes, they can focus on working with people with specific chronic health conditions, such as diabetes, or specific populations, such as homeless individuals. Job title can also be affected by the type of organizations that CHWPs work for and their HR systems. And funding streams, especially if the role is grant funded, can also affect job title. Pictured on the right-hand side is a word cloud that shows all of the different job titles that were reported on our CHW um, survey. And as you can see from the, from the slide, community health outreach worker was the title that was most often used. So although supply was difficult to measure, we were able to get a better sense of CHWP demand. And I'd like to start by saying that there has always been a need for CHWPs as they care for high need and vulnerable populations. However, um, the COVID-19 pandemic really highlighted this need and created additional workforce demand. Data from the CHWP survey showed that one third of CHWPs said that their employment changed as a result of COVID-19. 
And of those respondents, nearly two thirds said that their employment change resulted in increased hours. Additionally, some healthcare employer interviewees comment on, commented on the COVID-19 impact on demand. For instance, one interviewee said, I think COVID actually amplified the need for promotorists because they were flexible and they took on a lot of roles that were there before and they have done amazing work. In addition to creating demand, the pandemic also changed the CHWP role in some organizations. The chart on the previous slide showed that nearly one quarter of CHWPs who said that their employment changed as a result of COVID-19 listed an impact other than their hours changing. Examples of other impact that the workforce reported included shifting work responsibilities and taking on new roles. From the CBO perspective, one CHWP interviewee explained how her role shifted during the pandemic, stating that misinformation, misinformation and myths travel very fast. We're definitely seeing that with COVID. And so we do a lot of community building, a lot of trust building in the community. For us, that's definitely our strength that we're able to go back to our community and do a lot of unlearning, making sure that we are up to date with the pandemic, the information changes very rapidly. Some interviewees also noted other changes in the role as a result of the pandemic, including the need to provide COVID vaccination outreach and that the pandemic created challenges with integrating the role into the clinical care team. We were able to quantify demand with data from the CHWP Healthcare Employer Survey. The pie chart showed the number of survey respondents who said that they employed CHWPs. And as you can see, more clinic respondents employed CHWPs compared to hospital respondents, with nearly 80% of clinics saying that they employed them and 40% of hospitals saying that they employed them. It is also worth noting that CHWP wages varied according to employer type. In general, hospitals paid higher wages compared to clinics. For entry-level positions, most clinics paid between $16 and $20 per hour, while most hospitals paid between $21 and 20 to $25, or $26 to $30 per hour. This trend also continued for senior-level positions. For senior positions, most clinics reported paying between $21 to $25 per hour, and most hospitals reported paying at more than $30 per hour. Also, in some cases, CHWP wages increased during the pandemic, partially as a result of increased demand. Clinic and hospital employers also reported on how many additional CHWPs they plan to hire in the next 12 months, as well as how many they would ideally hire in the next 12 months, as shown in the bar chart on the left. And as you can see, both hospitals and clinics anticipated hiring more CHWPs, but clinics anticipated hiring more than hospitals. Additionally, both hospitals and clinics wanted to hire more CHWPs. This was especially true of hospitals who would ideally hire more than 10 times the number of CHWPs than currently planned. Clinics would ideally hire more than three times CHWPs than planned. So now I'll discuss a little bit about um, educational and hiring requirements of CHWPs. The pie charts on the right show hospital and clinic educational requirements for CHWPs. And as you can see, most hospital and clinic employers require that CHWPs have a high school education at minimum. However, hospitals more often required an associate's or bachelor's degree and sometimes a CHWP training certificate. Clinics and hospitals also shared similar job requirements. The bar chart shows job requirement data as reported from the health employer survey. And as you can see, the job requirement most often reported for both clinics and hospitals was work experience. Other requirements most important to clinics were being bilingual and having a California driver's license. Other requirements most important to hospitals were having a California driver's license, being bilingual, and having completed CHWP training. In thinking about hiring for this role, it is important to note that there are certain challenges associated with finding qualified CHWPs beyond having the appropriate level of education and meeting other job requirements. Some employer interviewees spoke about the challenges associated with finding qualified CHWPs. 
Specifically, one interviewee said, you don't just put this on LinkedIn or whatever, or other job sites. You have to take a different approach also in the hiring, having community health workers on your hiring committee, and also hire for some of those intangible qualities like passion and dedication to the community. Now I will transition to talk more about the CHWP training programs that exist in the state. For the state with the largest population in the country, um, there are relatively few opportunities for CHWP training programs or training in California. At the time of our research, we identified 25 active training programs in the state. On the right, you'll see a map of these training program locations. And as you can see, most of the programs are concentrated in the San Francisco Bay Area or the greater LA area. This left large parts of the state, such as the North and Central Valley, without any programs. It is also worth noting that pro some programs were completely online or had online components. However, it is challenging to assess if these programs had a presence outside of or beyond their own communities. Most active programs offer general rather than specialized training. And when I say general training, I'm referring to programs that teach core CHWP content that all or most CHWPs would or could use. This contrasts with specialized training, which I'm using to refer to programs that teach content that would be specific to a particular role, such as roles that might focus on a specific chronic condition or population. Although having CHWP training was rarely listed as a hiring requirement among healthcare employers, all interviewees described newly hired CHWPs undergoing training after they had been hired. Post-hire training varied in length significantly with a range to two hours to 16 months, the latter of which was an apprenticeship program. The structure of post-hire training also varied. Some organizations incorporated module style trainings while others had one large overarching training. Some organizations created their trainings in-house, some contract with other education or training institutions, and others participated in both. Many post-hire training courses also included a job shadow component. Now I will pivot to discuss some of the new billing mechanisms for CHWP services. And first I would like to discuss the state plan amendment or the SPA, which is often referred to as the CHW benefit or the DHCS benefit. The SPA became effective July 1, 2020 22, and it provides reimbursement for some CHWP activities, such as preventive services delivered in individual or group settings for certain issues, such as the control and prevention of chronic health conditions or mental health conditions. These CHWP services can take the form of health education, health navigation, screening and assessment, or individual support and advocacy. More details on the SPA can also be found online. So in our study, we gathered data from employer interviewees about CHWP billing, and I'd like to provide a small disclaimer about our findings. At the time of our interviews, the SPA had not been finalized and was thus incomplete. Although most interviewees were aware that the SPA was in development and generally understood that some types of organizations would soon be able to bill for CHWP services, Interviewees did not know which services would be covered or necessarily understand the mechanism for coverage. As a result, interviewee perceptions of the SPA, including who and what it was designed to cover, did not always accurately reflect the version that was approved. So our interviewees shared mixed opinions about the SPA. Some commented on their belief that the SPA could improve access to preventive care and potentially negate the need for organizations to demonstrate return on investment. Others fear that the SPA could potentially over-medicalize the profession by excluding CHWPs who do not work in a clinical setting, and that the SPA could potentially require formal CHWP education, which could create barriers for authentic CHWPs. Some interviewees were also curious to know if or how the SPA may tie into certain elements of CalAIM, such as enhanced care management. So CalAIM is another opportunity for more indirect billing of CHWP services. The cost of services um, may be reimbursed through two main components, which are enhanced care management or community supports. Interviewees, however, reported potential challenges associated with accessing CalAIM to support CHWP work. 
Some of these challenges included lack of organizational infrastructure to take advantage of ECM or community supports, ECM being too focused on case management or care coordination, which would not include other aspects of CHWP work, and potentially the idea that there might not be enough funding in CalAIM to support the hiring of additional CHWPs, um, the fear being that it might only be able to um, support the existing workforce. So the reason why CHWP billing is so important to think about right now is in terms of rural sustainability. Hospitals and clinics, but especially clinics, were concerned with funding uncertainty for the CHWP rule. Um, other top concerns included finding qualified CHWPs and staff, or staff turnover, particularly for clinics. Almost half of hospitals indicated no concerns with sustainability compared to zero clinics, which is also an important note. Another aspect of CHWP work that is important to consider is role advancement and growth. Role advancement is really important in terms of incentivizing CHWPs to enter or remain in the profession. And the, the pie chart on the left shows data from the CHWP survey, while the bar chart on the right shows data from the CHWP healthcare employer survey. As you can see, half of CHWPs reported that they had opportunities to advance. For the healthcare employer surveys, only 36% of hospitals reported that CHWPs had an, opportunity to, had an opportunity to advance compared to 85% of clinics. So as I begin to wrap up today, I would like to leave everyone with a few key takeaways. First is that the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the need and created demand for more CHWPs. Second, employers reported ideally wanting to hire between three to 10 times more CHWPs than currently planned. Third, there were relatively few training opportunities given the size of the state, especially in certain regions such as the far North and Central Valley. Fourth, interviewees expressed excitement about new mechanisms to bill for CHWP services, but also some concern about implementation. And fifth, funding uncertainty was a top concern for hospital and clinic employers relative to CHWP role sustainability. I would also like to provide everyone with some recommendations today. The left-hand column shows general recommendations that are applicable to many different audiences. The first set of which is applicable to training programs. Training programs have the opportunity to assist the workforce in several ways. First, they could expand new or existing training programs into new geographic areas. They could also provide subsidies or stipends for CHWP trainees. Training programs also have the ability to do better follow-up on their graduates to find out where they're working or where they get placed with jobs. And also training programs can provide, there may be a space for more specialty training to assist folks to assist CHWPs who want to focus on helping people with specific um, with, with specific needs, such as those with chronic health conditions um, or specific populations. Employers also have the ability to assist with CHWP, with the CHWP workforce. They can provide higher wages or offer career growth opportunities. They can also incorporate sustainable funding practices into their into the role. Which should, include, which should include de-emphasizing the concept of return on investment, as it is difficult to attribute specific um, improvements to individuals' health to CHWPs when they are working in a team-based care setting. There are op also opportunities for better data collection on the CHWP workforce, and state and national associations have the ability to take the lead on collecting these data as they have a unique understanding and interconnectedness with the profession. There are also opportunities for the state to assist the workforce. The state can assist the training programs by providing funding for these programs, and they can also provide their own subsidies for trainees. There's also opportunities to assist with billing. The state could help with spot implementation, especially for organizations that do not already have billing structures set in place. They can also ensure that CHWPs are a critical component of CalAIM. 
And lastly, the state can also assist with better um, collection of CHWP data. They can improve the accuracy of CHWP supply data to inform the state workforce planning, which could include emphasizing the use of the existing SOC code, regardless of employee job title. And lastly, DHCS and HCI can work together to decide on which other data might be important to collect about the workforce. Here are the chart and quote sources for the presentation today. And I'd also like to thank the rest of our study team as, as well as the advisory group for their help in, for their help with the study as they were integral to the success of the project. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, I'm gonna ask our panelists to come up, please, and take your seats. So a little uh, little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, I want to call your attention to the blue evaluation form that you all should have received. Please do take a moment to fill this out before you leave because it helps us in planning these, making sure that we are being as responsive to your needs as possible. For the people that are online, you will have an evaluation pop up towards the end of the session. So please do fill that out. Um, I want to emphasize the slide that sits behind me um, just to share that there are, as I think many of you know, a number of policy changes that are happening in California right now. Um, there is the, and much of it was seeded by the California Health Workforce Commission in 2019, which recommended scaling the engagement of community health workers, promotores, and peer providers through certification, training, and reimbursement. Um, in 2022, as we discussed, CHWPRs became covered providers in Medi-Cal through an approved state plan amendment, or SPA. Um, many CHWPRs, as you just heard, are involved in the CalAIM program. Um, the the 2022-23 state budget included funds to add 15,000 new CHWPRs to the state's workforce in recognition of some of the other things that were going to stimulate demand in the state. And finally, um, and in 2023, the budget also directed the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, or HCI, um, to initiate a certification program for CHWPRs who are participating as Medi-Cal providers. So you'll hear a little bit more about these things as we talk on our panel today. Um, with that, I would like to introduce our fabulous experts. Thank you so much for joining us. First, we have Angelica Alvarez. Um, who's the program director with El Sol Neighborhood Education Center, Educational Center. Um, Joseph Calderon, Joe Calderon, Senior Community Health Worker, Transitions Clinic Network. Elia Gallardo, uh, who's the Chief Equity Officer and uh, Deputy Director of Legislative and Governmental Affairs with uh, HCI. Um, Andrea Mackey, who is the policy man manager for uh, California Pan Ethnic Health Network, or CPEN. Um, and finally, Dr. Pooja Mittal, um, Chief Health Equity Officer with HealthNet. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, before we get going, I also want to acknowledge there, there are some fabulous experts in the room today who have a long history of doing amazing work supporting this workforce. Um, we cannot have all of you up on the panel, but I want to make sure that we uh, honor and uh, thank you for all you have done to advance and support this workforce in the state of California. So I'm going to get started by asking our panelists to tell us a little bit about your organizations and specifically your work with community health workers, as well as one or two important things that you want everybody to know about the role that this workforce can play in improving the health of the people of California. So we'll start with you, Angelica. First one. So everyone can 
can you can hear me right? Good good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to be here and please. My name is Angelica Alvarez. I work for El Sol Neighborhood Educational Center. El Sol is a nonprofit. Uh, we do work in San Bernardino uh, County and Riverside County. Uh, we have been able to, during 35 years, we have been able to train, to provide technical assistance, and to work with community health workers, promotores, or so um, I have been working for, for El Sol so for about 15 years, and I have had the privilege to train, to, uh, to work with community health workers, to supervise, uh, to deliver programs with them in San Bernardino County, Riverside County. So something that I'm very glad to be here is because this is a time to recognize the work of the CHWSPR. I'm very glad. Uh, as, as we know, after COVID-19, we have seen not only the struggle, but how our communities have been resilient um, uh, through the work of community health workers and how we see the strengths that we have in our community. So something that I want to say and mention is that um, CHWPR, they're experts. So we know that they're experts. They bring a lot of expertise and wisdom when we bring them in the table. Also, uh, uh, I want to, to mention this phrase that I, that I love from Hado Flaming. They say, because the wisdom of the community always exceeded the knowledge of the experts. So that means that community health workers, they bring a lot of expertise and maybe more than uh, some or other uh, people that have expertise in other areas. Because why CHW and PRs are very effective? Because they, they, they live in the same communities and also they have gone through different struggles that the community go through. And also, the beauty part of this is that they are able to connect with the community in a way that they can make changes in their community that they live. Um, they build a strong relationships, but not only that, they go very deeper. And they create those spaces that we can um, create uh, dialogue, we can uh, reflect, and we can really think about how can we solve whatever is happening in the community. Uh, the work of the CHW, uh, they they do different things. I mean, they today they are they are outreach workers. They they educate. They provide education information. But more than that, in the years that I have been working for El Sol, I discover that the CHW work is a vocation. It's something that they need to fill it. Is we we believe that we train brains and we recruit hearts. So it's a vocation. In the individual, in the individual aspect, um, when we talk about that vocation, that vocation is infused with wisdom and life experience that they already have. And I'm thinking about uh, the uh, big picture in the macro level is about hope. So how these CHW are bringing hope to our communities and how we can carry the values and the legacy in regards to the work that they do. Why we're here because we want to transform our communities, because we want to live in a, in a health equity uh, communities that can transform the work, that can transform our families and the communities that we are serving. I believe that without hope, we cannot do anything. But uh, the hope is the fuel for the struggle there's health equity. And I believe that we're here is because we believe in health equity and we're here because together we can do it better and best. That was great. Um, quickly, you know, Transitions Clinic Network is a community-based program that provides primary care services to returning community members like myself. Um, for coming home from prisons and jails, our program's patient-centered, or I would like to say person-centered approach that works closely with local organizations and community-based organizations to look at and address social services and the social determinants of health and acknowledging the, acknowledging the competing priorities of reentry. And, you know, having walked those yards, healthcare is not something we speak about. So going back and teaching men and women about speak and the key ingredient to change being hope, you know, as my sister over here said, hope. Hope is the key ingredient to change. And if we get hope out there, we can change. You know, um, community health workers from the community they serve build relationships that keep people in care, continuity of care, right? And with that continuity of care, the community health worker helps bridge the barriers and biases that hinder people from health care. 
Education is great, a privilege, but lived experience can't be bought or taught, it's lived. And so, you know, let, let us acknowledge that as well. Um, that's one thing I would love you to know about community health workers. I would also like you to know that Transitions Clinic Network's model is evidence-based. And in my experience, while we haven't studied this yet, but in my personal experience, has improved the quality of life while addressing a safe mistrust of systems. You know, thinking about, you know, everything that we've had to go through to get to where we're at today, saving tax dollars while creating jobs and empowering communities around health care. But we also have to acknowledge some of those barriers and biases might live in this room or might live in policy when we think about hiring men and women with histories of incarceration. But I can say without a doubt that regardless of the ECM population that's being served, when you have community health workers from the community they serve, it's almost common sense if sense was common. I'd argue it's not, but thank you. You know, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and I thank, you know, CHCF for everything that they're doing for California. And I look forward to striving towards health equity in California and doing this correctly. So as California does, the nation will follow. Thank you. Um, again, Elia Gallardo with, um, with HCI, with the Healthcare Access and Information um, healthcare information and access. Um, we in, at HCI, we're actually tasked with creating a certificate program for community health workers, promotoras, representatives, or CHPRs. Um, that, based on statewide standards, we're working to develop those statewide standards with a, a robust stakeholder engagement process, including community health workers, promotoras, and representatives themselves. We are really trying to capture that, that authentic voice of, of the community. We are also tasked with developing standards, again, in collaboration with the CHWPR stakeholders for training programs that provide the training that, that basically are based on the standards that are developed through community. Um, I think Carolina already mentioned, we're also tasked with the um, expanding the certified community health worker, promotora, representative task force or workforce by 15,000 individuals by the year 2028 and providing funds as well as stipends for community health workers, promotoras, in order to make this a reality for us. The state is investing in this model, the community health worker, promotora, representative model, because we see the value of the community health workers. We understand the outcomes. It's, it's been shown multiple over the last decades, but really did um, come to the forefront with the, with the COVID and the pandemic. Um, in terms of community health workers, I wanted to talk a little bit about my personal experience and background with, with promotoras when, when I was working with and staffing Lideres Campesinas um, in California, which is a farmworker women's leadership project. And, you know, because of a long history of many institutional and structural barriers that have created inequities for many low-income populations, including, community, including, including um, the Medi-Cal beneficiary community, that, that's resulted in tremendous health disparities throughout um, the, the Medi-Cal, throughout California, throughout low-income communities. And um, it's just, I just wanted to mention a couple of these dimensions or these barriers. The lack of healthcare professionals that come from the communities that we care for, and in particular that come from Medi-Cal beneficiary communities. The lack of trust within the healthcare delivery system. I think our two previous speakers spoke very eloquently about that. Um, and they also uh, did a wonderful job of talking about how community health workers, promotoras, representatives, how they bridge these challenging institutional and structural barriers that, that are faced by low-income communities because they themselves have faced those barriers. They themselves have advocated and figured out how to circumvent those barriers. So they're the perfect bridge for creating that connection between the healthcare delivery system, which again does not, as, as everybody has said, does not absolve the healthcare delivery system of its responsibility of coming to the community, but it is one of those things that supports that connection. Thank you. Hello. Hi, uh, good afternoon. It's an exciting time to be here. Um, I'm Andrea Mackey, she, her, hers, policy manager with the California Pan Ethnic Health Network. And so CPEN is, you know, a multicultural statewide health policy organization, um, you know, 
bridging and uh, bringing together and mobilizing communities of color across the state to advance health equity. And so um, in particular, I help lead the Community Health Workers, Promotores, and Representatives Coalition, along with Joe over here from Transitions Clinic, Vision y Compromiso, the Children's Partnership, Latino Coalition for Healthy California, California Consortium for Urban Indian Health, and um, Roots Community Clinic. So, you know, a bunch of us, along with, you know, 500 CHWPRs, you know, um, health plans, HCI, you know, we, most folks in the room, quite honestly, I think I've been on a Zoom call at some point with y'all, um, you know, we've been coming together to make sure all that these policies coming down the line are rooted in CHWPR voices, uh, you know, are financially sustainable, um, prioritize workforce diversity, you know, lead to equitable health outcomes, and at the end of the day, really value community cultural wealth, you know, the wisdom, the values, the stories that we have from our communities. And so a lot of, you know, this work and my, my mission to promote it all is, you know, rooted in my experience as a um, Filipina community health worker down in LA. You know, I used to screen for social determinants of health, provide diabetes education, um, provide resources to housing, um, food pantries, sign people up with CalFresh, medication assistance. Um, and I realized recently, actually, um, my mom and my Lola in the Philippines were barangay health workers, so I I'm, I'm, guess I'm following a legacy here. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, what was always powerful is that you see people transform from really being passengers, you know, coming crying, you know, their foot's getting amputated, um, to being, dry, you know, just drivers of their health. And so they're shifting um, positions. And so that energy and that spirit is what we bring into our coalition as all these policies come into play. And so, you know, uh, Carlina, you mentioned, you know, the, the role of a CHW in, in California, you know, what does, that, what does that look like? Well, the Children's Partnership really framed it for me. Um, you know, we see our workforce as an anti-racist strategy because we're shifting power to folks who most, um, you know, directly experience the, the conditions that cause the inequities in our health. Um, to being leaders in the field. So really excited to talk to you all today about you know, shifting power, you know, having CHWPRs at the forefront of our workforce. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to you, Pooja. Thank you for framing it. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today with this incredible group of leaders. Um, I'm Pooja Mithal, I'm from HealthNet. I'm their Chief Health Equity Officer. HealthNet is a managed care organization. We um, serve about 3 million people in the state, two-thirds of whom are on Medi-Cal. And we have a footprint um, that's quite diverse across the entire state, so rural and urban, um, and um, in Northern and in Southern California, as well as Central California. And um, I, really, I, I really appreciated what you just said around agency, because as a health plan, the goal of our organization is to improve the health of the communities and the people that we serve. And when we think about the difficulties in doing that, the biggest thing is trust, right? And progress only moves at the speed of trust. And that's what the CHW workforce and the promotoras and the representatives bring to the healthcare system. They help to bridge that gap between the community and between providers, um, county organizations and health plans so that people can feel like they see themselves and in doing so they create agency in their own health. And um, the other piece that we think about as a real powerful, um, a real powerful piece that um, this workforce brings is the ability to actually meet people in the community where they are and actually reach the people who are currently unengaged, right? We have people who are engaged with the healthcare system and they don't necessarily get what they need, but there are an entire other group of people that are fully unengaged with the healthcare system. And so how can we use this culturally congruent workforce to go out into the community, meet people where they're at, and start to build those bridges again and create that trust between the healthcare system and the community. Um, and uh, I, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I've had the privilege of working with Promotora since I was uh, little. I grew up in Ventura County, um, did my residency in Ventura County where I worked with Promotores there. And um, at San Francisco General, we had our Promotores coming into our clinics doing oral health screenings for our kids. And they were often really successful in doing that work where we had very little access to dental care for, for our Medi-Cal patients. So I um, have a lot of respect for Promotores and I'm really excited to be here to be talking to you all today. Thank you so much. I feel so far away from all of you. Um, 
So there are, as we discussed in the introduction, several significant policy changes that are happening in the state of California. A couple of you touched on them that are happening right now. Um, what else can you tell us about these changes and their potential impact in California? Um, and this time I'm gonna switch it up and um, ask you to start, Dr. Mittal. Um, thank you. Uh, we are, we are really excited about this being a benefit and, um, and are excited to help be part of rolling it out. Uh, one of my concerns around, uh, around this work is how do we really make sure that the benefit is being stood up equitably and in, in, in a way that's responsive to the community's needs. And um, we recently partnered with Vision y Compromiso. They did a survey of leaders um, in many of the CBO organizations that are traditionally doing this work and what they found was um, that people are unsure whether they really want to participate in this work, those CBOs, right? They, they're not sure how, um, how the benefit is going to um, be stood up, if it's going to be consistent with the culture of their organizations, and, um, and whether they'll be able to actually participate in a way that's equitable. And so I think that that's a really important flag for us to pay attention to. Um, I also see um, a couple of other big challenges. One, as a health plan with a large footprint, we are um, required and, and wanting to set up a network across the entire state. And there are regions where there are not enough yet people to staff those, those regions, particularly in some of the rural areas. And so how can we um, make sure that we're not taking shortcuts and bringing in some of these companies necessarily that are sort of coming into the space new um, and really supporting these community organizations that have been doing this work for many, many years. And uh, lastly, I think workforce is a really important piece of this conversation. Um, and I think we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but um, thinking about how we can support standing up a workforce that then has the opportunity to grow and also have new opportunities within the healthcare system is gonna be really important. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely want to echo. Hello. I uh, definitely want to echo all this. Um, you know, like I said earlier, this is a really exciting opportunity where you're getting all these investments from the governor. We're get, we have the Medi-Cal benefit. Um, you know, we're getting sustainable funding for the first time for our workforce, um, which could lead to economic equity, you know, in our communities across the board. You really see a community transformation model. Um, you know, but however, you know, we're still facing some current challenges. We were talking to, with um, our coalition, you know, CHWPRs, and only 10% of folks were telling us that their current salary covers basic expenses. So 90% of folks are saying that, you know, with their job, you know, they can't make rent, provide, you know, pay for gas, food, you know, just the basic. And so, you know, I've heard, you know, this is, you know, we do this out of service of the heart or, you know, the buy neon spirit, the community spirit, but the buy neon spirit doesn't pay the bills at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, for this to really thrive, how do we ensure that we have a payment mechanism that, you know, equitably allows us to not only meet our, you know, just basic needs, but to have a living, thriving wage? Um, and so that's what a lot of the CHWPRs have been telling us. And if you look at the, the benefit, you know, the fee-for-service model is $26 for 30 minutes for two-hour max per beneficiary. Um, you know, FQHCs cannot currently bill for this. Um, and, you know, you're not even uh, building in, you know, what is the overhead cost, the administrative burdens that now clinics and community-based organizations have to undergo to have the infrastructure to be able to bill for Medi-Cal now. So, you know, if we're following along, you know, where we're currently at, we're going to just replicate the status quo that has not worked for our communities. Um, navigating, you know, systems of care that, you know, means you're experiencing delayed care or no care at all, folks who don't look like you, you know, we don't need more of the same. You know, Joe always talks about, we can't do the status quo. That's why we need to transform how we're shifting all this um, and really push for economic equity for our CHWPR. So real opportunity, but we have, you know, this, this pathway, you know, how are we gonna move forward? And um, with that, I think I'm gonna pass it. Pass it. Oh, thank you. Oh. Um, I did want to mention that um, we've talked a little bit about how the commitment that was made last year for the health professions workforce, the administration actually made billions of dollars of commitment to the health workforce and the largest amount 
actually went to community health workers. So of that amount, there was a significant allocation, the largest of any other. So that should really reflect sort of the, the commitment that the, that the state has to lifting up and being part of the, the change that, that we're hoping to see. Um, and obviously, it's a clear indication of how important um, the, and what value the state gives to this incredible workforce. Um, in developing what, we, what we're going to be working on, which is developing a certificate program for community health workers, promotoras, representatives, what we're really looking at doing is making sure that we are aligning closely with our sibling organization, the Department of, the Department of Healthcare Services, to ensure that the training and the education that's received in any of the, any of the resources that we're able to allocate or any approved program that we look at, that those folks are coming out of that training and are going to be able to bill Medi-Cal for community health worker services. So we are closely aligning all the efforts that we're doing to make sure that that happens, because for us, that is the avenue or the pathway to get reimbursed for these services. So we are working hard to make sure that we align and yet don't create any kind of un unreasonable barrier to getting that certificate as a community health worker, a promotora, and a representative. Well, first, you know, um, some of the work that we've been doing and talking about in California is being rewarded. And I want to give a shout out to, to DHCS because on January 26, 2023, California became the first state in the nation to approve an offer for a set of Medicaid services for youth, adults in state prisons, county jails, and youth and correctional facilities for 90 days or three months prior to release. You know, doing this work in our sister clinic in Santa Clara County, um, prior to the CHWs going in and making contact, 30% of the people showed up for services. After, after uh, Santa Clara County Jail allowed the community health workers from the organization to actually go in, you know, roughly 90 days before to create a relationship and do a warm handoff, if you will, from incarceration to the community, allowing the community to play a part in it, that number went up to 70%. So, you know, thank you. And I'm thinking about as California moves forward, and we're thinking about that 90, in re 90 day in reach, please, you know, everyone in the room that has a say so on what that looks like, community, community, community. Let that live in the community and let those resources and let us be a part of the solution. Let us play an active part. Um, Cal AIM and the CHW SPA if done correctly will be a step towards health equity in California while empowering communities providing jobs, and I'm hoping providing career pathways for community health workers, a living wage, respecting the profession, saving lives while saving money, can, can, and policy that can guarantee the sustainability of community health workers in California as California strives for health equity. Wow, community, community, community. Yes, the, for the, for, I mean, we're very excited about what is happening. This is a great opportunity. Uh, we believe that the community health workers peers have so much expertise that they can provide and amplify the work of other entities in regards to their policy, the system, and the environment. However, they have to be open to uh, pro so the, the CHWPRs can provide that expertise and also those organizations that have been working for many years. Um, we believe that uh, this is a powerful opportunity. Uh, however, what happens if those entities do not um, are flexible or open to listen to those uh, organizations that have been working with the CHW? That's a huge problem, and the problem is because we believe that the CH uh, the CHWPR will be have to adapt to a new culture. And what happened is that culture, if it will be far from the community, uh, they will be less embedded in the community. And um, the originality in regards to be aligned with the community, work with the community, that will be far away. So, our, our I, I think if we do it right, if we invite uh, those experts that have been working in the field for many years, I think we this is a huge opportunity in regards to um, provide more more resources for the community to uh, amplify the, their voices and also to create a system that is uh, is is held equitable for everyone. Thank you all so much. Um, incredible and amazing work. So I'm going to ask one more of my questions, and then I'm going to turn to some of the audience questions. Um, 
And a really important part of the community health worker and promotor workforce is the premise of nothing about us without us. Um, the American Public Health Association encourages engaging CHW promotor and representative perspectives in policy related to the role. So several of you are or have been CHWs. Um, I would love to hear just a little bit more about what you're hearing from the workforce right now. Um, and why don't we start with you, Andrea, at the other end? Yeah, so we've been um, we've been talking to a lot of folks, um, training folks on you know who is Department of Healthcare Services, who's HCI, um, even just walking them through how to pronounce HCI. Um, and so, you know, with our you know these trainings, you know, we've been hearing a, a four main themes. You know, as we you know work towards integration, so folks are saying, you know, I have a lot of stats today, but um, you know, 60% of folks of the CHWPRs we've been working with say, you know, the general public doesn't know what we do who we are um, and, you know, how effective we are. Um, and so a lot of it is, you know, how are we building up respect? How are we building up value, you know, valuing um, our workforce and giving folks decision making, not giving, but making sure we have decision, decision making powers being seen and heard, whether that be on the care team, whether that be um, in policy, um, you know, as we move forward. You know, again, I had mentioned before, economic equity is a key theme across the board. You know, how are we, you know, folks are experiencing economic insecurity. You know, folks want a thriving wage. Folks want, you know, benefits because, um, you know, there's, we're either paying, you know, out of pocket for some curriculum, um, for trainings, um, you know, for gas, you know, going back and forth to community members. Um, and folks are saying, you know, this is a lot of work. Um, healers need healing too. Where are the mental health? supports for us. And then, you know, in building up workforce development, you know, when we're, we're talking about all these upcoming policy events, um, you know, how are we getting these paid trainings, whether that be for, you know, you know, doing referral services or navigating, you know, these different outreach um, to COVID-19, to technology and resume support. People want more professional development to grow in their career. And then also just more development in, you know, policy. Um, you know, we're, you know, all these um, events are coming to a forefront, you know, um, you know, how, how are people just going to be, someone was saying, like, if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. Um, and so, you know, how are we bringing in CHWPRs to more of these conversations? You know, this is, this is a great panel and a, and a good example. And then with these benefits coming down the line, you know, how are, we've been struggling to understand how are community members going to be able to access our services? Um, you know, in particular, folks were saying, you know, there's still a need to have more black CHWPRs, more CHWPRs in rural and agricultural areas. Um, we need to really bridge, you know, the, um, the connection between hospital providers um, and folks on the ground and members to be able to, you know, get access to these services. And then are we, do we have the materials and the resources for our community members that are culturally and linguistically tailored to what folks need? You know, is that ready there? Is housing there? You know, um, I think we mentioned it. We're not, we're, we're bridging the gap, but you know, there's some structural issues that collectively we need to change. And so, you know, a lot of folks are in this and we're, we're really excited, but you know, again, this is an anti-racist strategy. So how are we pushing CHWPRs to the forefront of this? Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, how about you, Joe? Promise not to start chanting. <laughs> you guys want to chant? Um, nothing without, you know, nothing about us without us. Nothing about us without us. You know, CHWPRs want to be a part of the process. We want to help define our work. We want to be a part of the certification process. We want to help, you know, in creating the career pathways. You know, um, CHPRs, you know, um, I'll try to just, I'll try not to repeat anything that Andrea said, but, you know, professional respect is what I hear when 60% of the community health workers in California say, people don't know what we do. Because I've walked those shoes and I've been a community health worker, I know what we do. And if California and the nation knew what we do, there would definitely be more investment and more pathways. Um, you know, more training is what we heard, you know, not less training. You know, we've had seasoned, you know, promotors and community health workers come to us, you know, looking at the different numbers that are being thrown around and just going like, really? 
And I agree, you know, they, they're saying that our profession needs to be respected and invested in, and that includes stipend trainings and such. Um, I'm, I'm going to say it again because, you know, it's just not happening as much as it should. Healers need healing too. A, a lot of us with lived experience, secondary trauma, et cetera, et cetera, healers need healing too. While we bridge those gaps and barriers and biases, you know, sometimes those scars open up. Sometimes I bleed. Um, healers need healing too. You know, when we're talking about economic equity, you know, we recently had a, a policy committee and I love the way it was defined. And let me read this really quick, really quick. It refers to ability to be financially secure and to thrive personally and professionally. This is more than just the ability to meet your basic needs, but for you and your family to live your best lives. An example of this might be the ability to take your, your family on a vacation. Self-care, self-care, self-care. Can CHWPRs get paid enough to live their own life, live their own best life? And, you know, I think a lot of that comes from the meetings that we have. And I feel it's really important, blessed and grateful to be sitting here representing community health workers, PRs, and really everyone that falls under our umbrella can go on, on with the terms of who falls under those umbrellas today, thinking about what California needs to do as we strive towards health equity. Without, heck, without health equity, I question any of the other things that we've been given in the books. Joe. Um, all right, y'all. Powerful words. Thank you so much. Um, I have a lot of other questions, but I'm going to give um, some air time to some of our audience questions. Um, so can you speak to your point, Joe, about the importance of appropriate supervision for CHWs and promotores in managing vicarious trauma and boundary issues? I know um, TCN's done a lot of work around this, so maybe we'll start with you again, Joe. I appreciate that. You know, in thinking about, you know, secondary trauma and, and, and what we, I got me stuttering secondary trauma, but... <laughs> Thinking about the services we need, when I was originally hired to Transitions Clinic Network, we actually had our own therapist, which I thought was one of the best parts of the model because not only did the therapist have a working and, and we could, co just like we, in our model, just like we can co-sign for our doctor and say, hey man, that doctor's all right, or whoever we're talking to, the people we're talking to, you know, regardless of he, she, they, we would tell them and co-sign. And that co-sign bridges some of that mistrust. Um, and so when I'm thinking about secondary trauma and those type of things and healers need healing too, it would be lovely to see a system that's set up with a flow that actually has therapy involved where you can actually do a check-in with who's on your caseload first and then how are you doing with an understanding about secondary trauma. You know, there's also secondary resilience and teaching secondary resilience to the CHWs, promotoras, and everybody else is out there to remember how this work is hard and we're passionate, but it's necessary. I don't know if I answered, but I hope. Yeah, you did. did. Thank you, Joe. Um, and Helica, do you have anything to share? Sure, I mean, in regards to supervision, I think the first thing that uh, when I supervise is really understand the work of the CHW. Uh, many of our supervisors, they have been promotores. I mean, they have been doing the work in the field. They know the work. They know how to talk to the promotor. They know in regards to boundaries, to safety, to confidentiality. So I think when I think about supervision, it's very important for the person to really understand the work. And, and to really provide that support that the promoter uh, needs in that specific moment. Great, thank you. Okay, so this is a tough one. Um, how do we optimize this workforce without creating a two-tiered two system based on immigration status? Um, some promotores are hesitant to pursue new job opportunities because they don't have work authorization. Um, how do we wrestle with this tension? We got any brave panelists that want to take this one on? How about you, Elia? Do a piece of it. Um, I guess the thing that I would say is uh, we've been very intentional in in how we're crafting the the training and the certificate, as well as to be honest, the community, the DHCS has been intentional with the with the benefit. Um, there's never a request for information from on any part of that for immigration status. So in order to receive a training, um, that's not going to be part of the process 
in order to receive a certificate that's not going to be a question on on the application and um and i as as from what i understand to to serve once you get the the chw certificate what it says is that that you've been trained and you're eligible to um to provide services that can be reimbursed by medi-cal so i you know we don't speak for employers we can't do anything on the employer side but at uh, we've been very intentional to make sure that that we didn't create barriers on on our end and the training end in terms of this population. So I don't think that's a satisfactory answer, but that's that's as far as we are able to go. Thank you, Elia. Um, and I think you know, Joe, you mentioned earlier, policy can be infused with bias, and I think that it's a great example of where HCI DHCS have been really intentional about thinking about the potential barriers. Um, we all know that there's a ways to go and there's other uh, things that we have to circumvent and address, some of the much bigger picture issues, um, like the one we're talking about now. But um, just uh, uh, I'm grateful to you all for the thoughtfulness with which you've gone through that process and for all the people that have participated in it. Um, so is the 15,000 CHWs, including current CHWs, including current CHWs, or is it new CHWs, additional ones? Um, and are there steps to retain CHWs um, in addition to bringing on new folks? So the, the, um, the goal is to have 15,000 new certified community health workers, promotoras, representatives. So we are including the, the existing folks that we are reaching out to and trying to develop what we call our legacy pathway. Our legacy pathway is actually the place where we've gotten the most feedback because we are talking to existing promotoras who have been doing the work forever and, and basically don't need to go through a training to show that they can do what they've always been doing and doing very successfully throughout the years. So we're trying to create that pathway where where folks like that can get the certificate um, to, to count for the existing workforce. The other workforce goal that we have, this is an equity goal that, that we have not only for ourselves, but for the, the secretary and the agency has for us is we're trying to make sure that in, in developing a certificate program and developing our training program and pathway and developing our legacy pathway that we retain the diversity of the existing community health worker workforce and that we retain the language concordance and the, with the populations that they currently serve. So that is one of our goals, is we wanna make sure that in creating a, what I'm, I'm gonna put in air quotes, a formal process, that that process does not take away from the equity aspects that everybody's been talking about in on this panel. Thank you, Elia. Go ahead, Pooja. Can I just add one thing? I think. Um, Another really important piece of that. So at HealthNet, we've had promotoras on staff actually since 2011. And as we think about um, broadening this benefit, actually, when we look at our, our members, we estimate that 70% of them are eligible for CHW support, CHWPR support. And so as we train more people and bring them into this system, we need to be very clear about that over medicalization piece or like taking something that is actually a social justice movement and not over incorporating it into healthcare so that we change the essence of what the movement is about. Thank you so much, Pooja. And that's powerful because health that's big and so 70% is a lot of people. So um, thank you for that. Um, okay, audience. Do you have any questions for us? And also we have been asked to slow down the pace of um, our talk for our wonderful translators. So for the panelists, if you can slow down just a tad, that would be great. Um, yeah, uh, I think we have mics. Hi, Christina from the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative. I'm incredibly interested in, in what data we have currently specifically about hospital utilization of this important role. Um, and I'm wondering if we have the data, have we dug into county or regional differences, <clears throat> service differences? I'm very interested in pregnancy, uh, maternal birthing person care, so that, and then for-profit institutions versus not-for-profit institutions. And it, it just 
um, thank you for your last comment, Pooja, because I think that was a really telling comment. But I'm just love, so I'd like to know what's up with the data. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think a lot of the things that you're talking about, specifically in California, um, I am not aware that we have some of the deep data that you're looking for on service lines and things like that. Um, but I'm wondering, Jackie, is there anything you want to add on the hospital perspective um, based on the survey that might speak to the question? Yeah, I think that's a very good and important question. Um, I would definitely recommend that you take a look at the, the report, the Healthcare Survey Employer Report, because um, that does have some data and statistics about um, employment of CHWPs in the hospital setting, but we didn't do a deep dive into the geographical regions that you, that you mentioned, although I could definitely see the value add that would be there. Can I maybe just put in yeah, a Yeah, please, Pooja. So um, we just granted funding to Health Begins, and Joe behind you is the one that um, partnered with CPAN HKI to do um, a large em employer survey of who's employing CHWs right now in the state. It's He's collating the data right now, so that's something that we'll release for everyone to be able to see. Um, but he did break it down by region, so we have some data about regions. And um, into your, to your comment about pregnancy, we did ask about uh, population served, and I think that there is going to be a gap in people who are sort of serving that prenatal to five population, and so that's something that we'll have to think about as, as we invest in workforce. Thanks, Pooja. Hi, my uh, name is... Oh, go ahead. My name is Robin Barron, and um, I have a question about recruitment of um, black CHWs and also community health workers, um, promotoras in rural areas. Um, I'm wondering if there's like any plan on how to do that um, and also um, funding for these programs to exist and continue running. Yeah, great question. Um, so I'm going to think there's two ways to look at this. Maybe Pooja from HealthNet's perspective as a rural provider, but also um, Elia to talk about a little bit about the status of the budget right now um, and where things are. So why don't we start with Elia this time? Okay, I get to do the status of the budget. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the, the administration has made a, a huge commitment to community health workers and um, in the amount of over two, $280 million. A, a, pretty sig a pretty significant part of that, about $130 million, is still committed to the community health worker sector. It's being delayed to be issued out um, in later fiscal years, next, next fiscal year and the year after because of the current fiscal situation that we're in. And that is um, those exact training dollars that we are looking at to provide for training programs and stipends for community health workers. And obviously, we're going to be looking very carefully at the disparities that have been identified through the through the research and that other partners are identifying so that we can look at the distribution of those dollars. We haven't even begun the stakeholder engagement process on that type of dialogue. For us, it's very important to make sure that we're checking in with stakeholders to have the dialogue to understand how these, how all of this is going to look and the framework and ultimately how we're going to issue out those dollars. Because of the delay, we haven't started that dialogue yet. So we are looking forward to engaging all of you in that discussion. Great, thank you. I, I thank you for the question around the cultural congruence. And it's something that we are certainly thinking about. And, and not only for this benefit, but for the doula benefit, how are we looking at making sure that we have providers that are culturally congruent to serve everyone that we serve. And so that's something that we're looking at when we're um, investing in training programs. And we just um, granted um, Vision y Compromiso and El Sol um, uh, large grants to, to train several hundred CHWPs. And so um, that's a place to start. But as we get a better sense of where there's a need, what types of programs people are interested in, um, that'll help us to better understand. And we are providing stipends for those because you have to pay people for their time. Yeah, and I'll add just one thing to answer this question. I think one of the things we've heard anecdotally is that a lot of black CHWs 
don't necessarily identify as CHWs. Um, they may be doing community work in churches, doing health education. Um, and so I think there's also a question to be asked about like who's out there already doing the work, um, whose work can be surfaced and, and lifted up um, that may be able to uh, benefit uh, sort of the Californians and Medi-Cal beneficiaries that we're talking about today. So uh, another question from the back of the room. Uh, Lisa Chanson uh, with Transform Health. It's so great to hear everybody's uh, comments, experiences, and it's such an exciting time. But I also want to point out that we've talked about CHWs in support of a lot of different populations as well as in a lot of different settings. And my question is around you know, just adding to some of the questions around data and the different cuts of data, has anyone done an assessment of all the different places that CHWPRs, navigators, you know, whoever's out there that's doing this work is already operating and what is the demand and the need? When we do our CalAIM work, we hear often from the field there are not enough CHWs, that providers are poaching from each other, that it's been a real challenge. And then, you know, we're not always supporting the CHWs in a trauma-informed way. And I remember San Diego County did a fairly in-depth assessment where they looked just in San Diego County and assessed how many um, these types of workers are needed over the next 10 years. They currently have a little over 4,000, and they estimated they need over 7,000 of CHWPR navigator type workers to support public health, hospitals, clinics, in community settings. And I, my question really is around, has anybody drilled down in terms of the data to look at how many, what is the level of need in each of these arena? And what is the type of potentially advanced trainings that could be provided? Are there ways to build career ladders and really lift up the individuals who are entering into this workforce, into this space? I remember when we were running Sacramento Whole Person Care Pilot, CHWs were at the heart of our program and they, we had to really evolve and think about the different types of CHWs that we really needed to support the chronically homeless population in this county. We needed some that were in the aging space. We needed those who uh, were previously incarcerated, homeless, who had uh, farm worker lived experience. And that was just in supporting the one population here in one county. So I, I wanted to lift that up. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thanks for reflecting your your whole person care experience. It's important for us to remember that there have been a lot of CHWs doing work in the whole person care context for, for some time now um, prior to Cal Um So I'll take a quick stab at your question about regionality. I think um, one of the things we're doing at the California Healthcare Foundation is supporting four regional collaboratives around the state um, and uh, our looking to scale uh, the workforce in those regions. And uh, it's uh, Alameda, San Diego, Riverside, San Bernardino, working um, with El Sol and then the Central Coast. Um, and part of what they're doing in those regions is looking at supply and demand. It was one of the things that we were looking at statewide, which we found extremely difficult to get to at scale. And so I think those kinds of regional efforts are really, really important. We did a webinar recently as part of that um, work to look at how you could um, quantify supply and demand in those regions. And so we'll have that posted on our website and I invite you um, to check it out. Um, all right, how is our time? Wrap time, oh my God. Okay, so um, I have spent, I just talked and it's our wrap time. So I wanna invite um, each one of the panelists to just say maybe two words about um, your takeaways from today and what you want the audience to think about leaving this room and make it quick because we don't have much time. Okay. Um, it will be two words, but I might have to give context. So 
Um, so I'm going to end with something that, you know, we end community organizing. In Tagalog, it's isang baksak. It means one down, one fall onto the next. So when one of us falls, we all fall. But when one of us rises, we all rise. And so looking at this panel, if we're all moving together collectively, we're going to be able to address health equity. We're going to address disparities. So, you know, if we do this collectively with CHWPRs at the front, you know, one down onto the next, you know, we're we're going together, we're going to rise together. So, Isan Baksak. Isan Baksak. Um, I, I have like a sentence maybe. One is, uh, I think we have a real opportunity around health equity here um, with this workforce. And also we have the economic development opportunity for a whole entire new group of people that can build a pipeline for a BIPOC uh, providers, nurses, MAs, like, the whole thing and part of what we're thinking about is how can we start earlier and really um, help people upskill and and fill out all these other professions where we need more black and latino um, providers so you went where i was going with workforce equity we're we're obviously we're very interested in making sure that we are are providing a, a program that really does have that centered in in the in our in the work that we do, and we're looking for your support in helping us make sure that you hold us accountable to making that happen. So please do participate in our stakeholder engagement process because we're still at the beginning stages. We haven't made any final decisions yet on anything that we're doing. So please do tell us how we're doing, tell us how to do it, and ultimately weigh in on on what we come out with. Thank you. Status quo has never helped my community, and status quo has never been a spark of change. So let public health be the spark that addresses policies moving forward that serve people. Two words, no mas, equity now. Beautiful. Okay, so I will say that this is a great uh, place uh, to start. I think it's very important to recruit your CHWPRs to really think about the training uh, and supervision that is very important to connect with those experts. The we don't have to invent the, the, invent the will. The will is already existing. We're doing the work. And also, uh, I have to take one phrase that Cara said this morning, that this is the time to serve them better. And I believe this is our time. Thank you. So incredibly powerful. Um, so I'll lift up a couple of things I heard from you all in addition to those magical words. Um, this is a vocation, but people need to thrive. Um, remove bias from policy. The importance of CHWPR voice. Um, workforce is an anti-racist strategy and shifting power. Unprecedented investment, but we've got work to do. Um, learn, uh, learn from the long term. Learn, learn from the agencies that have been doing this for a long time. Professional respect. It works. Um, healers need healing too. And this is about more than meeting basic needs. Um, so with that, I want to thank our fabulous panelists for their wonderful words today. Um, and thank you to all the folks who helped to organize this fabulous event. I want to remind, remind all of you to fill out your evaluation forms. Um, and please do grab a lunch if you haven't already. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Take care. <laughs>